pretty simple. Um, just in case, let's say, let's, I'll tell you the words. You are holy, you are mighty, you are worthy, worthy of praise. I will follow, I will listen, I will love you all of my days. Okay? I think we can do this. And if the words come up, we're good. If not, or um, I think I'm getting this signal, so I think it's a keep talking. Um, oh, we're good. Look at that. Okay, here we go. I feel like my voice is warmed up after that one. <laughs> Some fast words there. Beautiful. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to Sonnenberg Mennonite Church. It is good to be gathered as the body of Christ, whether here in person or joining online, to hear a word from the Lord this morning. Uh, I would like to call your attention to the beautiful new banner on this side of the sanctuary. 
Um, it is the first of 10 banners that will be hung at different times throughout this church year as visuals of what the kingdom of God looks like based on Jesus' words in the Gospels. To go along with our theme, uh, which is the banner right on this side that I can't see right now, um, of seeking first the kingdom of God. Um, and you may hear a little bit of something this morning about an upside down kingdom, or rather a downside up kingdom. Um, the scriptures on the banners will be included under each picture, um, but I think it will also be fun to kind of to guess which parable or representation is being depicted. Um, see if you can guess what that picture of the kingdom is without looking up that scripture. Um, but these banners are thanks to the collaborative work of Michelle Steffen and Juanita and Dave Ross and Winford Ressler. So thanks to that creative team of artists for these beautiful banners. Well, this is the second Sunday of Lent. When Aaron Kaufman was here with us last Sunday, he shared about a ministry called the Soil and the Seed Project that Virginia Mennonite Missions supports. And while I was checking out their resources this week, I came across this helpful definition for Lent. Nothing profound, just very simple, but it said that Lent is a season of reflection, prayer, and fasting before celebrating Christ's resurrection. Lent feels like a natural and appropriate time to slow down and examine ourselves in light of what Christ has done for us. I don't know about you, but I definitely need the reminder to slow down. Pastor Glenn talked about slowing down as a spiritual discipline at the discipleship class on Wednesday evening. Uh, maybe it's just my season of life right now, but life feels so, so busy. And I know for myself that it's not until I'm in a quiet space and I have intentionally removed distractions that I am most able to connect with God's spirit and what he is trying to speak to me. And this is different for different people. We all connect with God in our own way. A devotional that I'm listening to during Lent had this quote by Brother Lawrence. The most holy and important practice in the spiritual life is the presence of God. That is, every moment to take great pleasure that God is with you. Not an easy thing to do, but one to strive for, and that can bring great meaning to every experience that we go through in our lives. So to prepare our hearts for worship this morning, we're going to practice slowing down by beginning with a moment of silence to remind ourselves that God's loving presence can be found wherever we happen to be and inviting him to open our hearts to hear from him today. So let's just pause here for a moment of silence and then I will close us. God, thank you that you are here with us this morning. Open our hearts to hear from you. Amen. Part of our musical shift this morning means that there will be a couple less songs and a couple different songs, so you may not um, experience what you see on your bulletin. Um, but this next song, Your Labor is Not in Vain, um, should be somewhat familiar. We have the music um, on the screen for you. Um, this part of the shift as well is me leading like I haven't ever done before. And about, I think it was eight or nine years ago, for some odd reason I don't remember, I was on schedule to be hymn leader here on a Sunday morning. And um, so I went over to my Grandpa Till's house and I said, Grandpa, can you teach me how to... Um, direct these few songs and so he taught me and what do you know the next day there was a snowstorm and we didn't even have church <laughs> so I was prepared and then it didn't happen um, so I'm digging back into my my reserves to try and come up with this but I trust your I trust your graciousness will sing along with me
to sit down here. That's fine. That's actually, scoot back. You're on my foot. Hello. Welcome. I am going to talk with you guys today about Lent. You guys know what Lent is? We've been talking about it a lot in church, haven't we? Yeah. But I want to ask you, I want to check real quick to make sure you guys are up to snuff on your numbers. Like, have you been studying math at school at all? Yes. Do you know your numbers? Like one, two, three. Good. How high can you count? 100. That's good. Can you count to 100? Can you count to 10? Yes, you can count to 10. There are some special numbers in the Bible, aren't there? Some numbers that we see a lot. Can you tell me some of those numbers that we see a lot? 10? There were 10 commandments and 10 plagues, right? How many days were there in creation? Seven. Seven, right. And on the seventh day, we rest, right? In honor of that seven days of creation. Right. How many tribes of Israel were there? Oh, I may have stumped you. Your math is not working. There were not 10. There were 12. Good job, Everett. And there were also how many disciples of Jesus? 12. Again, right. Okay, so how many gods do we serve? One. One. But in the Bible, we are told that God is triune. What does that mean? Three. That's right. God is three, but God is also one. That's kind of a mystery, isn't it? Yeah. I want to talk with you guys about a number that you may not remember very much from the Bible, but it's in the Bible a lot. It's in the Bible 159 times. Can you guess what the number is? It's not seven. So seven might be in there a lot. The number is not 100. It's not 12. Nope. Can you give me my notes there? I just dropped them. It's the number 40. Do you guys remember 40 in the Bible? No. What was that, Jesse? 40 days and 40 nights. What happened for 40 days and 40 nights? They were in the desert. Who was in the desert? Israelites. They were actually in the desert. Do you know how long? For 40 years. Yeah. Yes. But Jesus was in the desert in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, right? Fasting? Yes. Because he was focusing on God. That's right. 40 days and 40 nights is how long it rained. When God flooded the earth, that's how long it rained, 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? Um, also, 40 years. That's how long they wandered in the desert before the Israelites got to go into the promised land. Yes, and that's how long David was king and Solomon and Saul. They were all king for 40 years each. That's a long time. Yes, and 40 days is how long Moses was up on the mountain with God getting the Ten Commandments. 40 days with God on a mountain. Do you think you could survive? I think I would, you know, I'm not sure I would survive the first day, right? No. 40 years, or the number 40 in the Bible, often is referring to something that means a trial or a tribulation or a time of testing, okay? And also in the Bible, 40 can mean like there were 40 righteous that Abraham said, hey, God, if I can find 40 righteous people in all of Sodom and Gomorrah, will you spare them? Did he find them? Yes. No, he didn't. No, but God was very patient, right? But that was how many people he wanted to find. Also, 40 stripes. What does that mean? Is there a flag somewhere with 40 stripes? No. Stripes in this sense means lashes. Somebody was very, very bad in the Israelite community. 
they were allowed to give them 40 lashes or 40 stripes as a punishment. Also, there are 40 writers of the Bible. There are 32 in the Old Testament and only 8 in the New Testament. 40. We see 40 everywhere in the Bible. And so you know what? We see 40 everywhere. The early Christians also saw the number 40 everywhere, and they decided they were going to do something about it. They decided we're going to fast. We're going to be have a special time. We're going to call it Lent. I don't know where they came up with that name. I looked it up, and it doesn't really mean, like, it doesn't have, like, a special mysterious meaning. It's just what they decided to call this special time of fasting. They called it Lent. It's for 40 days before Easter. Why do you think 40 days before Easter? Well, they wanted it to be 40 days because they remembered that Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days, right? And was tested by the devil before he started preaching and teaching and healing people. So they wanted to fast for 40 days and focus their minds on God for 40 days before Easter, before they celebrate that God came and saved us, right? And so what does it mean to be fasting during that time? You guys know what it means to fast? Jesse. You don't eat. You don't eat anything like Jesus? Okay, you can drink water, but you can't eat food. That's an extreme fast, but yes. Yeah. So normally Christians, they fast from certain foods. Can you think of what sort of foods they might fast from? Do you guys, have you ever experienced fasting in your own homes? So what are some things that that people fast from during Lent? Anybody, not just the kids. What was that? Sugar, yes. So sweets in general, but sugar, so not putting sugar in your coffee, not having iced sweet tea, no sugar, no cookies. People fast from coffee or from alcoholic beverages sometimes. But in the Catholic tradition and in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, they, they fast from meat. They don't allow themselves to eat meat during, during Lent. They want to make it difficult on themselves. They want to give up something. They want to give up something that is important. And why do we give up something during Lent? Why do we fast? Why do we give up something? Why bother? We give up something so that we can give that attention to something else. What would we be giving our attention to during Lent? Jesse? Jesus. Thinking about Jesus. Thinking about Jesus' sacrifice. Thinking about Jesus' life. Every time your belly is like, oh, I really want to eat a hamburger, you're supposed to spend that time thinking about God. Praying. Thanking God for his many blessings, right? Yeah. So it's not just fasting because Jesus fasted. It's fasting to draw us closer to God. Yeah. And it's 40 because 40 means something important in the Bible. Right? Anytime that we see the word 40, it often means that there's testing and trials, being tested. Fasting is a way of testing your body and your mind and your heart to draw closer to God. And then at the end of Lent, what do we get to celebrate? Easter. Great big, huge celebration with lots of good food because, and eggs. Because we finally come to the, the celebration where we are. We finally come to the time where we're celebrating that Jesus not only died, but he came back to life. And he brings new life to us, right? All right, I think you guys are okay on your numbers. Remember the number 40, okay? All right, you're dismissed. Thank you.
Our scripture this morning comes from Mark 10, verses 32 through 45. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Rhoda, for that lesson on Lent and on the test with the numbers. 40. So many of you know I'm I'm big on numbers, and I would have known that 40 was in the Bible a lot of times, but would anybody without knowing would have guessed 159 times? That's... A lot. I would have never guessed that it was in there that many times, nor did I, I don't think I ever made the connection that it was often related to trials and testing. So often. Um, not sure how the, the, the reigns of Solomon and David and Saul were, I guess, probably times of trial and testing as well. Being king of Israel, I'm sure it was not easy. I also want to thank everyone for their work this morning in like surprising ways for Michelle leading music, you know, directing, even though you got out of it when church was canceled, and for Aaron leading worship for the first time. I also want to thank the uh, audio visual guys who do stuff sometimes at the last minute. Most of you would never know that one of the projector bulbs was out and was replaced minutes before the service. Things that happen, Pam playing piano, you know, and being willing at the drop of a hat, youth coming up, leading a song that sometimes the words were there, sometimes there weren't. I, I think I've shared this quote with you before, but I was at a Michael Card concert. Many of you might know who Michael Card is, this artist, singer, songwriter. And it was a, a pretty intimate gathering. It was at a church, it was a big church, but he said he was going to lead us in a song that he hadn't perfected yet. And he said, not very often do professionals do this, put themselves out there. But this is a quote that I always remembered, and I might have shared this before. He said, I believe, as Christians, we need to operate right at the edge of our ability so that if God doesn't show up, we fail miserably. Catch that? We need to operate right at the edge of our ability so that if God doesn't show up, we fail miserably. Now, that's not necessarily comforting, thinking that we'll fail miserably, but it just is a reminder for us to rely on God. And I sometimes feel like that every time I get up here. I, you know, should grow in comfort, you know, being up here week after week, 
But sometimes I'm like, all right, God, am I going to say what I should say? Am I ready for this? Am I going to be too nervous? But God is with us, and he helps us get through anything that he calls us to. Last, um, two weeks ago, when I shared a message, it was on the transfiguration, and Peter was talking, he was talking three different times, remember I said I could have titled that sermon, Peter, 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 because of the three different things of when he either got it right or didn't, and the transfiguration was the focus two weeks ago, and on the mountain there was the voice from the cloud that said, this is my son, whom I love, listen to him. And I asked you all to try, it was a listening skill of pausing. Did any of you try that, of interacting with others and taking an intentional pause in your conversation and listening to Jesus? And you don't have to share right now. Maybe during the sharing time, there might be a a profound experience someone would like to share but of listening to Jesus. The last week or so, we've been focusing more on being with Jesus. And it was highlighted in, some of, in the song this morning and what I shared Wednesday night. This last week, when Aaron Kaufman was here, he talked about how God is doing a new thing. And it was so good. You look at the bulletin, you see the image there of the kingdom downside up or upside down. I, I really appreciate these images that Chip finds to put on the bulletin. And I really wish you all could see some of them that he comes up with that don't make it to the bulletin. He, he comes up with some doozies and sometimes he has quite the theological discourse or explanation that it would be great if you could all hear some of the significance that he comes up with that sometimes are really amazing or weird, but they're great. And so thank you, Chip, again, for finding one that represents this this theme so well. This upside-down kingdom or kingdom downside-up, I just worded it a little bit different. You've probably heard this before, and that's actually a question that I have is, are you familiar I'm assuming, again, that you've all heard, or most of you have heard, of this idea of the upside-down kingdom. I just changed it a little bit, saying downside-up. So, Chip and I were guessing you would all know the word glossenheit, the yieldedness, a few weeks ago, and we were way off with that. But I would be curious to know how many of you have heard of this idea of the upside-down kingdom. Just with a show of hands. Okay, so a majority of you. Good. We thought that was this this Anabaptist understanding of the upside-down kingdom that Jesus portrays a different way than the culture. And there is this book. How many of you are familiar with The Upside-Down Kingdom by Don Crable? Donald Crable. Okay. Show of hands again, this book. So this book came out the year after I was born, 1978. So it's practically as old as I am. And I have to confess, I've had this book for some time, but I don't, I've never read it. And so this week, going through this, since I titled my sermon this, finding a number of things about this idea of the upside-down kingdom, I want to share a couple things just from the foreword about how there, there are no scarcity of books and tapes and radio broadcasts on discipleship. And that's what I'm talking about in my two kingdom our two Wednesday night sessions of discipleship, what we're going through. But in the foreword, it's pointed out that in spite of all the popular Christian teachings about Jesus' lordship, it's commonly understood what comes first. Too often, we all think that our careers come first, getting our house in the suburbs come first, our upscale lifestyles come first, then with whatever time, energy, or resources left, we can follow Christ. This idea of discipleship that gets a backseat emphasis. The Upside Down Kingdom, this book, is for those serious about following Jesus. This call to this upside down kingdom. Not only in the spiritual dimension, but in all of life. 
Crable's book here is provocative as the parables of Jesus. I wanted to share this because it's written by this Tom Sign, who is the author of The Mustard Seed Conspiracy, which, if we hadn't known, is what that first banner is about, which I preached on a few weeks ago when we talked about, and our first banner, first one of our ten messages or uh, scripture texts on the kingdom of God. So this idea of the kingdom being upside down. Jesus is explaining to his disciples and those that are following what the kingdom of God looks like, and they so often just don't get it. This idea, this metaphor, this understanding of the kingdom of God is so rich, it's fairly complex, it's not easy to just explain. That's why he uses it in so many different ways, and the, the definition, the understanding can just keep growing in what the kingdom of God is like. I have a few slides. We're putting the, the audio visual tech guys on their toes this week with extra things. And I, I want to share three things that happen. So there is this idea that Mark has this cycle that happens in three chapters in a row. And It is on discipleship and servant leadership, and it points out how these things happen, three things repeatedly in a row. And it is taken from this book called Four Portraits, One Jesus, from Mark Mark L. Strauss, and his second edition came out in 2020, and there's this nice chart in uh, my study Bible, that portrays this, this three cycles of events that happen in Mark. And you can find in your bulletin, in the notes section, this outline of spaces that you can fill in as we go through this. And I haven't done this very often, we'll see how well this works, of going through these three cycles of events in the Gospel of Mark. So, Three times Jesus predicts his death. And if you look in your Bibles on, in chapter 8, oh, I'm sorry. Three times Jesus predicts his death. There we go. And the first passion, passion prediction, see if you can find it in chapter 8. The first passion prediction is in what verses? Is 8, 31 to 32. And this was my passage two weeks ago that leads up to the transfiguration when he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Okay? The second passion prediction, you can see in chapter 9. There's a pattern here, 31 and 32. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. And the third passion prediction, look in chapter 10. so nicely, neatly ordered that it's like the same verse in each chapter. In 1032, what Aaron read this morning, they were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. Again, he took the 12 aside. We're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man was delivered over to the chief priests, teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him in three days he will arise. Three times he predicts this, all right? Over these last two weeks, these three things happen and are following through Mark. Each time, the disciples have the same response. They respond with pride and, what's your guess? 
misunderstanding. Look what happens each time. Peter rebukes Jesus in 8.33. Look what he says. That's from two weeks ago. But Jesus, but when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, or at the end of 32 actually, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter, said, get behind me, Satan. So the disciples just don't understand Jesus' explanation. Debate over who is the greatest in 9, 33, and 34. The second time, they were walking along, and Jesus explained that he was going to be handed over, and they came to Capernaum, and when they're in the house, he asked them what you were arguing about on the road, but they kept quiet on the way because they had argued about who was the greatest. Why, each time when he predicts his death, do they think about power and authority? And the third time, we have this request of the chief seats in the kingdom. Look at 10, 35 through 41, what Aaron read this morning, where James and John ask for the greatest seats. And the third part of the cycle is that Jesus follows with teaching about servanthood and cross-bearing discipleship. So if you look back at 8, chapter 8, the very next thing, in 34, he explains the way of the cross. So he predicts his death, Peter rebukes him, and he says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And that's what I explained two weeks ago. Take up your cross. Servant leadership. I think I'm missing one. The first shall be last is in... How did... We got nine ahead, ten or ahead of nine. In nine, thirty-five and thirty-seven, after they were arguing on the road about who was the greatest, Jesus sits them down and says, Anyone who wants to be first must be very last and the servant of all. And in nine thirty-six there he took a little child whom he placed among them, taking the child in his arms, he said, Whoever welcomes one of these Little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, does not, whoever does not welcome me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Sorry. And then servant leadership in 10 there. You have him the third time. He explains how... He's predicting his death. And we have this request from James and John for the chief seats. And they ask if they can have these seats. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you picture Jesus trying to explain this to his disciples? Each time he predicts his death, how he's going to be handed over, and each time they respond with this way off understanding that's either full of pride or wanting seats of position and honor. Now, I, I picture this scene of Jesus just kind of reaching exasperation. He's explaining that he's going to die. And it's coming. And his closest friends aren't getting it. They're like, oh, you're going to die? Can we have the best seats next to you? He's like, you don't, you don't know what you're asking. And he asked them, can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the, baptiz with the baptism I am to be baptized with? Referring to the suffering and the death 
that he is about to face, they have no idea what they're saying, and they're like, oh, yeah, we can. And then he says, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right and left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they've been prepared. He, submit, he submits to the authority of his father for these positions. And the ironic part, you know what those positions will be on his right and his left? They're not positions of power on thrones. They're the two crosses. Those are the seats on the right and his left. And so, and then when the ten heard that James and John asked about that, they were so upset. Why were they upset? Because they wanted the positions of power and authority. And the third time Jesus has to say, he explains what this kingdom of God looks like. And it is not what they're thinking. It is upside down. They keep asking for to be the greatest. And he says, you know, those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials, they exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. The climax of these, this cycle, of these three things, of Jesus predicting his death, the disciples responding with, with pride and misunderstanding, and then Jesus explaining the way of the cross, it, it culminates in this next verse, 45. The climax is the cross. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, how in the world did these guys not get this? Jesus explains it over and over again. And I can picture him saying, now boys. And they were most likely teenage boys. And maybe that's why they didn't get it. They were teenage boys. No offense, teenage boys. But these disciples were trying to understand and they just weren't getting it. Why was it not getting through? Why were they guessing the exact opposite? of what he was trying to convey. I talked about discipleship training Wednesday night. And we ended up with these three goals. And the first one being, being with Jesus. How do we spend time with Jesus? Now these disciples had been spending all this time with their rabbi. They got called to be followers of Jesus, their rabbi. How do we spend time with Jesus? How do we be with Jesus? And I really appreciate that quote that Aaron shared from Brother Lawrence about the practicing the presence of God. This idea, this notion that Brother Lawrence shares is that even in doing the dishes, any of the most mundane tasks, you can celebrate acknowledging God's presence with you. That the disciples had Jesus with them physically. We can acknowledge the presence of God's Spirit being with us at all times. We don't have to have a man that we're walking beside, but in everything that we do, acknowledge that Jesus is with us. In our Kingdom Seeking sessions, we wrote down on the pieces of paper that were at our tables what the Kingdom of God looks like, and I was processing the reading over them. I have them all hung up in my office. You walk by, you can't see it. It's on the wall that's where the door is. If you want to see any of those, you can just walk in and see them. I have them all hanging up there. And on the one, the one paper that has written in large letters, the Kingdom of God is like, and there's this nice flower, 
I was looking at a number of those comments on that page this week, and it was overcoming pride, celebrate in humility, freedom in humility, acknowledge and encourage others' gifts and talents and investment. And it seemed to be perfect with this passage of how the disciples and how often do we live out this prideful understanding. We, how often do we seek to lord over positions of honor or are we willing to take the lowly position? Are we willing to follow Jesus' model to be a servant? In the, cult, in the climax of that verse, that Jesus came not to serve, but to, not to be served, but to serve and to give up his life as a ransom for many. At the end of Crable's book, The Upside Down Kingdom, he highlights how Jesus' ministry is set in motion with this idea of the basin. When he stooped to wash the disciples' feet, he modeled this upside-down notion of serving others. And it set him on this trajectory to the cross. He refers to this basin ministry. The disciples could not believe it when Jesus offered to wash their feet. That was what the slave of the house would do. And he was willing to get his hands dirty. He's their rabbi and teacher and master, modeling the lowest, lowly act. One of the things I highlighted in the Upside Down Down Kingdom book was this quote, First, we must be willing to deny personal ambition before we can pick up a, a cross. And sometimes we think of a cross to bear as a great challenge or a burden. Something that either a tragedy or gets thrust upon us or we we think that it's something that happens to us. But Crable argues a cross is something that is willingly taken up. It's a choice. It's an attitude of servant-heartedness that we have to choose. And it's this invitation that Jesus offers for whoever or whoever will take up their cross. It's something that we must choose to do. How are you being called into greater humility? This is something that has always been a challenge for me. I've shared that I've had no, no problem with a with my idea of of being confident. I'm often overconfident. But how are we each being called to a place of greater humility? How can we serve one another? I really appreciated that song, Michelle, that you led, the our labor is not in vain. For everything that we do in all of our work, our labor is not in vain. And did you catch the line that was repeated? I think it was four times in each verse. It was, for I am with you. Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us. As we take on this approach of servant-heartedness, of choosing to bear a cross, and to grow in humility, how do we live out this idea of discipleship? And what I talked about Wednesday and will continue the next time that we meet is this idea of being with Jesus. There is three goals. It was being with Jesus, becoming like Him, and doing as He did. But this first An important aspect is being with him. And it's acknowledging that his presence is always with us. Let's pray.
God, we thank you that we are 2,000 years removed from you introducing the kingdom. We thank you for the ways that you explained it over and over, your, over and over to your disciples of what the kingdom of God is like. Over the course of these next months, but starting today and even these past weeks, help us to grow in our understanding of what you mean by your kingdom and how it looks upside down from culture around us. But really, the kingdom that you're introducing is right side up. It's the way that we should live. Help us to see the world through the lens of this servant leadership that you modeled. Help us to seek first your kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of our transitions here is that we are no longer doing that song, It Is Well, but I will suggest that we sing the song, Seek Ye First. So it's number 324 in the Blue Worship Hymnal. I should have grabbed one myself. We sang it just a few weeks ago. I'll lead us in this song. It is just the verse 1 and verse 2. And I invite anyone that wants to sing the, the descant, the second part there, um, while we sing verse 1 or verse 2. We'll sing this together. Number 324. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be What seems ironic in this song of ask and it shall be given to you, how James and John asked. They asked for something of Jesus. But the important first part is seeking first the kingdom of God. Their request wasn't lined up with the kingdom of God. Their request was they weren't seeking first that kingdom. They were seeking the wrong kingdom. How we must first have our alignment with what the kingdom of God desires, what Jesus desires, and then we can ask and it shall be given to us. Come to our time of announcements and sharing. Are there any announcements or sharing this morning? I have a couple things. First, I'm happy to share that 